Texas. All right, fantastic. All right, well, we have reached our time that we um, can start our webinar. We're gonna still have some friends joining us, but I just wanna say welcome. Um, we are so excited to have um, a webinar series that is hosted by our friends at FEE. Um, so you're gonna get to hear a little bit more from them in a little bit. Um, but this particular webinar um, is a webinar about statistics and it's called How to Read Statistics. So just a little bit of housekeeping. I know we've all had our fair share of Zoom calls over the last year and a half or so, but um, you are welcome, of course, to use the chat function um, to ask questions um, of our speakers. You can post them there um, and you can click, just click the button at the bottom of your screen to be able to open the chat. We will address most of those during our Q&A session after Dr. Davies' presentation, um, but if you want to keep a record of it, that's a great place to do it. Um, we are also going to have some great giveaways, so that's super exciting to think about um, getting some fun giveaways from our friends over at FEE. Um, joining me today um, are Dr. Anthony Davies. He's the Milton Friedman Distinguished Fellow at FEE. Um, he's an associate professor of economics at Duquesne University and the co-host of a podcast called Words and Numbers. Dr. Davies authors monthly columns on economics and public policy for the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Pittsburgh Tribune Review. Um, he's written a book on understanding statistics published by the Cato Institute, and he's co-authored hundreds of op-eds for, among others, Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, and the Washington Post. Also joining us today is Dr. Ravi Paul. He's an associate professor and chair of the Department of Management Information Systems at the College of Business at East Carolina University. Um, he earned both his master's and PhD in industrial management at Clemson University, go Tigers, um, after completing his Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Bangalore University. He's an NCFCA parent, a debate coach, and the chairman of the NCFCA debate committee. So thank you gentlemen for joining us. I'm gonna welcome you on camera um, and then we will um, have Dr. Davies do his presentation and then Dr. Paul, you guys can have lots of great conversation. We're gonna be excited to, to join you in that. Thank you, Kim. So Dr. Davies, am I on? Your... <laughs> yes, you're okay. on, sir. Yes, you're on. Got it. I think I've Thank seen you. you both at a tournament somewhere. Yeah. In you, the past. You probably saw Dr. Paul, not uh, I I haven't yeah. done a tournament, um, but I've spoken to students who have done tournaments. I'm happy to do so, and I'm very glad that you had me here today. I'm going to talk about understanding statistics, and this whole story begins with how we learn mathematics. When we learn mathematics, we were used to thinking of fixed numbers. So you have a number line and your, your teachers or your parents says, how many dogs are there? And you identify on the number line, there are two dogs. And then you get another dog and you say, well, how many dogs are there? And you identify on the number line that there are three dogs. And doing math like, like this gives us this sense that numbers are fixed which they are, but it's what we call a deterministic way of thinking. Math is deterministic. You've got something that's two or three or four or 2.5. The numbers are what they are, but the world tends not to be deterministic, but stochastic. That is the numbers kind of, you could think of them as vibrating. And so in the deterministic world, we say something like, four is bigger than three and four is always bigger than three if you can find an instance in which four is not bigger than three you have upset everything we think we understand about mathematics that's a deterministic way of thinking about numbers but in statistics numbers are stochastic so it's like saying not four is bigger than three but dogs are bigger than cats 
generally speaking, that's correct. Now, you can find a particular cat that's bigger than a particular dog, but it doesn't, that particular example doesn't negate the truth of the statement that in general dogs are bigger than cats. That's a stochastic statement. And so when we study science in school, we study what we think of as the hard sciences. And we think of them as hard sciences because the measurements in the, these sciences, think physics and chemistry and biology, these number, the, the measurements that we undertake are deterministic. So you say things like increasing the number of protons alters the chemical element, or the greater the distance, the less is the gravitational attraction, or applying force to an object will cause the object to accelerate. These things happen every single time. They're deterministic. But in the soft sciences, the social science amongst them is economics, the truths aren't deterministic, they're stochastic. And so you say spending more time studying will get you a better grade. Generally speaking, that's correct. It's not correct in every single instance, but in general, it's correct. When the minimum wage rises, unemployment rises. In general, that's correct. It's not true in every single instance, but in general, it's correct. Regular exercise will make you live longer. In general, that's correct. These are stochastic statements, statements that are true on average even if they aren't true in every particular instance. And so stochastic phenomenon, because they're, they're, they vibrate like this, they're difficult to describe. So I ask you a question, what's the typical number of children in a household? And so we take a survey of households, we get these, these 13 households, and we ask how many children are in each household. And you could say, well, the answer to the question, what's the typical number of children? Well, the average is 2.6. We call that a mean. The average is 2.6. Well, that's not very useful. It doesn't make sense because you can't have 0.6 of a kid. What does it mean to have 2.6 children? And so we have another measure, and that measure we call the median. That's the guy in the middle. And if you line up all the households from the least children to the most children, the guy in the middle is two. He has two children. But you look at this sample and you say, well, that doesn't make sense either because you're asking what's the typical number of children and Two is the least common of all the numbers of children here in my sample. So there's another measure we can use. It's called the mode. And the mode is the most frequent observation. And if you look at these households, the most frequent observation is a household with no children. And so you say, well, the mode is zero. Well, if you're trying to get your head around the typical number of children in a household, that doesn't make sense either, because most of these households have children. And what we're bumping up against here is the problem of taking this very rich, complex thing, a stochastic uh, phenomena, children in household, and we're trying to reduce it to a deterministic number, 2.6 or 2 or 0, and none of these numbers fully captures the, the, the essence of what's going on here. So this is one of the problems we have with stochastic processes. It's difficult to talk about them. And because it's difficult to talk about them, we arrive at certain misconceptions, and I'll talk about some of them. For example, a percentage change and a percentage point change are different things. There was an instance back in the early um, 2010s where uh, Michigan politicians were proposing to raise the state sales tax from 6 to 7%. And the politicians said in defense, look, this isn't a big deal. It's a 1% increase from 6 to 7%. Yeah, except that's not a 1% increase. That's a one percentage point increase from 6 to 7. It's actually a 17% increase. That is, if I have a 6% sales tax and you figure out how much taxes you owe, and then we raise that tax rate to 7%, and you figure out how much taxes you owe, the taxes you owe just went up by 17%. 17% 17 versus one percentage point. Another misconception that we have, a declining share doesn't necessarily mean less. So this is something that people talk about a lot when we talk about poverty in the United States. They say, look, in 1969, the poorest 20% of Americans earned 4.1% of all the income. 
And in 2019, the poorest 20% of Americans earned 3.1% of income. And people will compare those two numbers and say, look, the poor are worse off in the United States today. They only get 3.1% of income when before they used to get 4.1% of income. Except, here's the thing, from 1969 to 2019, total income rose by 20%. So, although the, the share of income that the poorest 20% earn today has declined, it's a smaller slice of a much bigger pie. And so the amount of income that the poor earn today is actually adjust, even adjusted for inflation is actually significantly larger than it was in 1969. Yes, it's a smaller slice of the pie, but it's a smaller slice of a much larger pie. Another um, misconception, things that sound similar in English may be very different in statistics. In the early 2000s, there was a class action lawsuit filed in New York City against the New York City Police Department. And the, the class action lawsuit said that the New York City Police Department was promoting males uh, to the male police officers, promoting them to detective at a greater rate than they were promoting the females. And so they said, look, this is evidence of gender discrimination. So the prosecution in this case asked the question, what are the chances of an officer being a promoted female versus what are the chances of an officer being a promoted male? That's the question they asked. But turns out that that's the wrong question. The right question sounds very similar. The right question is, what are the chances of a female officer being promoted? So the two questions, the wrong one, what are the chances of an officer being a promoted female? And the right one, what are the chances of a female officer being promoted? In English, they sound almost the same, but here's the difference in statistics. When I ask, what are the chances of an officer being a promoted female? We look at all the officers and we ask the question, how many of these have been promoted? And then we take the promoted females and we divide it by the total number of officers and you get 25%. And the prosecution pointed to this number and said, look, this is evidence of gender discrimination. We're getting females being promoted at a rate of 25% when it should be 50%. But here's the thing, they asked the wrong question. The right question to ask is, what are the chances of a female officer being promoted? To ask that question, you first look at all of your female officers and you ask how many of these officers were promoted. You then divide the number of promoted officer, female officers by the number of, you divide the number of promoted female officers by the total number of female officers. And that number is 67%. The two questions sound almost the same in English, but they're very different. In fact, the outcome of this gender discrimination case hinged on translating that question into statistics correctly. So this second question was the correct question. And in fact, the case was, was dismissed because once it was, once they conceptualized the question correctly, they realized that there was no gender discrimination here, at least according to these numbers. Another misconception, what's true, and this is probably my favorite of all of them, what's true for the whole is not necessarily true for the parts. And let me show you something even interesting, uh, very interesting, here it is. So you've got a soci sociology department and we're looking to hire people. We have five male applicants who have applied for a position in the sociology department and the sociology department hires one of them. So the probability of a male applicant being hired in the sociology department is one out of five, 20%. Also, eight females apply for positions in the sociology department, and the sociology department hires two of them. So the probability of a female applicant being hired is 25%. So in the sociology department, if you're a female, your female applicant, you're more apt to be hired than if you are a male applicant. How about the math department? 
Math department, similar thing. Eight males apply, the math department hires six of them. So if you're a male, there's a 75% chance you got hired. How about the females? Well, there were five applicants and the math department hired four of them. If you were female, the probability of you being hired was 80%. So in both cases, the sociology department is erring on the side of hiring women. The math department is erring on the side of hiring women. But if you put the two together, the total number of male applicants here is 13. The total number hired is seven. 54% of the male applicants were hired. And if you do the same thing with the females, you see 46% of the females were hired. And here's the fascinating thing. I'm gonna tell you two things that sound contradictory and they're both correct. The sociology department is, if you're a female, you're more likely to get hired in the sociology department than a male. If you're a female, you're more likely to get hired in the math department than a male. But if you're a female, you're less likely to, to get hired in the combination of the two than if you're a male. This is, this is a phenomenon that we call aggregation bias, and it shows up lots of places. What's true of the whole is not necessarily true of the parts. So I give you this simple example. Here we have a, a group of people, and this is in 2010. Person one is 90 years old. Person two is 80 years old. Person three is 70 years old. It goes down the list. And person 10 was just born. Person 11, person 12 haven't been born yet. Person 10 was just born today. He's zero. This is 2010. The average age of my people here, 45 years old. Now, go away and come back 10 years later. 10 years later, what do you see? Someone new has been born. Person 11 was just born yesterday. He's zero. Person 10, he, was, he had been born 10 years ago. So today he's 10 years old. Person 9 was 10 a decade ago. Now he's 20. All of these people have aged. Oh, and person number one, he died. So he's no longer there. Now look at the ages here of my people in 2020. The average age is 45. Go away, come back 10 years later. It's now 2030. And yesterday, person 12 was born. He's zero. Person 11, who, was, who had been born the last time we were here, he's now aged. He's 10 years old. Person 10 was 10 years old. He's now 20 years old. Everybody's aged. Oh, and person 2 has died. What's the average age of everybody? The average age is 45. Now, here's the aggregation bias. Two things, both of them are true. The average age in 2010 was 45. The average age in 2020 was 45. The average age in 2030 was 45. The average age was constant. It's always the same, it's 45. And yet, every single person aged. It's an aggregation bias. What's true for the whole the average age stayed the same, is not true of the individuals. Each individual got older. Now, that's a made up example, but we do this all the time with real numbers. You'll hear politicians talk about how horrible it is that the median workers wage has, has stagnated since the 1980s. And here you see, this is the actual data. This is the median workers of the guy in the middle, the median American workers age, uh, wage and salary adjusted for inflation. And you could say it goes up a little bit, but basically it's kind of flat. And we're talking whatever this is, 30, 40 years here. And so politicians point to that and say, see, this is what's wrong with our economy. Nobody can get ahead. The median workers wage is the same today as it was 30, 40 years ago. But it's an aggregation bias. Because what happens with wages is the same thing that happened with the ages that I just showed you. As time goes by, people get raises. They start earning more. Older people who are at the top of their earning career, when they hit retirement, they go away. They're not earning anymore. It's like the people who died. And new people come into the job market, freshly minted graduates, and they earn a low amount because they're just entering the job market. That's like the people who are being born. 
And so when it comes to workers' wages in this country, we follow the same pattern that I showed you with those people's ages in those charts. In fact, if you track the median worker over time, you find that the median worker looks like this. What this blue line you're seeing is the typical American's wage as he goes through his working career. He starts off adjusted for inflation, low at $25,000, and he goes through time, he ends up earning up to $50,000 by the time he goes to retire. Each worker's income is actually doubling over the course of his career, despite the fact that the average has remained the same. It's an aggregation bias. Observation bias is a similar thing, and I'll, I won't ask you to answer, but take a moment and think about it. What fraction of U.S. workers do you think earns the minimum wage? What fraction of U.S. workers do you think earns the minimum wage? 50%, 30, 20, 10, down to zero, down, down to one. And the answer is, of all of these, E comes closest, 1%. And here you're looking looking at the fraction of US workers earning the minimum wage and look at that vertical axis. These are all the top of the chart is 1%. Everything below that are fractions of 1%. When we think about the minimum wage, we, we have this tendency. In fact, I ask my students, how many people do you think earn the minimum wage? And they typically say around 30%. That's way off. It's around 1% or less than 1%. And why? what's going on here? What's going on is an observation bias. Think about it. When you go out into the world to buy things, you go to Walmart or you go to the grocery store or you go to Starbucks or McDonald's, who are you interacting with more often than not? More often than not, you're interacting with somebody who's earning the minimum wage. And so you have an observation bias. When you go out in the world and you transact, you buy and sell, or you don't sell things, you buy things, you're interacting with minimum wage workers predominantly. And so you get this sense that many, many of the workers are minimum wage when in fact they aren't. You just aren't seeing the ones who aren't minimum wage. With statistics, we go and collect um, information, we run tests and we present evidence. And one of the things that happens often is that non-statisticians non confuse evidence and the absence of evidence. Evidence tells us something. The absence of evidence doesn't. I'll give you an example. Here you are sitting in your house and you ask yourself, is the dog inside? And you collect information. You look and you see there's a dog. You have evidence. And so you conclude the dog is inside. Now let's do it again, but this time the dog's upstairs and you ask yourself, is the dog inside? And you start to collect evidence. You look and you don't see the dog, you look around, you're not seeing the dog anywhere. There's no evidence that the dog is inside. Does that mean the dog is outside? No, the dog could be upstairs, it could be in the kitchen, it could be, actually it could be outside. But notice what's happening here. The, ev the absence of evidence that the dog is inside is not the same as evidence that the dog is outside. Let me say that again. The absence of evidence that the dog is inside is not the same as evidence that the dog is outside. The absence of evidence is simply no conclusion. I can't say anything. I have no evidence. Now, this seems kind of simplistic, but we make this mistake all the time. There was a study published in the 1990s about the minimum wage. It's a famous study by uh, two economists, Card and Kruger. Card just recently won the Nobel Prize. And in this study, they did not find evidence that raising the minimum wage caused unemployment. They did not find evidence that raising the minimum wage caused unemployment. The media grabbed this and pronounced that raising the minimum wage doesn't cause unemployment. And notice the media made the same mistake that I just warned you about. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Card and Kruger found nothing. They got no result, which is very different from saying they got a result that the minimum wage doesn't create unemployment. Definitions matter. Um, 
when we talk about wages and frequently people will say things, there are some politicians I can think of who say often that median wages haven't grown over time. And this is the picture that I showed you a little bit earlier, but here's the thing, definitions matter. Workers aren't paid wages, they're paid compensation. Compensation is a combination of wages and employer paid benefits. And if you look at the correct definition, compensation, you see this, that adjusted for inflation, worker compensation is actually up 45% since 1970. So the definition, what is it you're talking about matters. The context also matters. Um, as of June of 2021, 550,000 Americans had died of COVID. And this is the number that the media points out and everybody says this is horrible, we need to do something and I'm not saying it isn't horrible, but I am saying that context matters. Because although 550,000 Americans on an annualized basis are dying of COVID, the number who die of heart disease and cancer together are about twice that amount. And what's different about the heart disease and the cancer is while COVID even left untreated, we would eventually get a herd, herd immunity. You don't get herd immunity to heart disease and cancer. So COVID comes along and it plays out for as long as it plays out and then it goes away. Heart disease and cancer, they don't. Year after year after year, you keep on getting these deaths. And why does the context matter here? The context matters because if we're going to do something and say, look, we need to shut down the economy, we need to shut down schools or whatever it is because of the danger of this thing, it's important to ask, are we treating other things that are even more dangerous with the same care? For example, if you look at COVID deaths by age, look at the left at the left of this graph, you see the zero, people who are aged zero to 17, people who are aged 18 to 29, that's the number of deaths that have occurred from COVID amongst those age groups. That number is one fifth of the number in those age groups that die of suicide annually. So again, the context, if we're going to go to the extremes that we have gone to, to protect young people from COVID, why aren't we going to five times that number of extremes to protect them from suicide? And the reason that we aren't doing that is because we've lost sight of the context. We look at this thing and we say, this is a very bad thing. And indeed it is, I don't mean to say it isn't. But there are other things that are far, far worse that we have treated less carefully. Finally, last thing, when you think about statistics, don't follow your heart. In 2001, in an apparent suicide, a teenage pilot flew a private airplane into a building in Florida. This was right after 9-11. The teenager, it turns out, was one of 37 teenagers across the United States who were using Accutane which is a prescription drug for severe acne. 37 teenagers using Accutane committed suicide that year. And there was a huge outcry. Concerned parents were calling for the FDA to ban Accutane. This was the heart. You see this, oh my God, 37 kids using Accutane have committed suicide, we need to do something. And the FDA under political pressure came close to banning Accutane. But here's the problem. We're thinking with our hearts, not our brains. If you think with your brain, you don't just look at how many Accutane users commit suicide. You also look at how many people who don't use Accutane commit suicide. And you look at how many people who take Accutane don't commit suicide and how many people who don't take Accutane don't commit suicide. You look at all of this. And if you look at all of it, you come to a conclusion that the incidence of suicide amongst teenagers not taking Accutane was eight times that amongst teenagers who were taking Accutane. And that actually makes sense because, you know, it's hard enough being a teenager, let alone being a teenager with severe acne, and the Accutane helps to treat that. It helps takes one more pressure off of what's already a hard thing of being a teenager. The hard thing here, the hard lesson is, when this event first happened, we tried to think with our hearts and we saw 37 teenagers who committed suicide using Accutane and we said, oh my God, we've got to ban this. 
we came close to banning something that actually prevented teenage suicide. We would have actually made the matter worse had we not taken a deep breath and thought about this with our brains instead of our hearts. So if you've enjoyed this, um, Ms. Kromer was kind enough to mention my podcast, Words and Numbers. I have a podcast. We come out on all the podcast players every Wednesday. And particularly if you're interested in government and economics from the perspective of a regular person who's just interested in the world around them, check us out. We have some time for questions. Dr. Davies, thank you so much. Wow. I um, was sharing with Dr. Paul earlier this morning my own experience with statistics. Um, I would have done well probably to start with your beginning course there um, to help us understand the world of statistics. But first, before we jump to our questions, and I will remind you guys, if you have a question, go ahead and post it. We've got some good ones in the chat. Um, we've got some added, so Dr. Davies and Dr. Paul will have a good conversation about that shortly. Um, but for now, um, before we do that, I want to pass the camera over to our friend Hannah Langdon, who is an NCFCA alumna and is also working over at, um, at FEE to help them out. So Hannah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again to FEE um, for hosting our webinar today. And um, I know you have some giveaways that you want to share with our friends. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Cromer, and thank you, Dr. Davies, for that talk. Yes, um, thank you all so much for coming out to this webinar. Fee is really excited to have more outreach into the speech and debate world because we love debate students, and I'm biased because I love to debate too. We are giving away two separate packages that will include a copy of Dr. Davies' book, Understanding Statistics, which will build off of the information you heard today if you want to learn more about it. And we're also giving a fee swag package away with a t-shirt and some of our signature items. And I am happy to announce that our winners are Matthew Tolbert and Elisa Wong. So if you'll email me at hlangdon at fee.org, which I'll put in the chat, I will get in touch with you to get you your giveaway packages. Thank you all so much again for coming out here. Super exciting. Thank you, Hannah. So she'll post her um, email address for those winners. All right. And with that, we will go to our questions. Dr. Paul, I'm going to hand to you first. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Dr. Davis. That was uh, really a lot of fun. Thank you for um, helping us get some of the some of the basic ideas down. Um, I, I know you are being a fellow professor. I'm a big fan of uh, building excellent foundations to, to build on. And um, I, I see this as, as definitely an example of that. Um, so we have some questions for you, uh, but I, I'm gonna start with uh, sort of maybe setting the stage uh, for where these questions are gonna come from. Uh, so, so this is, mostly our team policy debaters. Um, I say mostly because it, it can be used in Lincoln Douglas value debate as well, um, but use evidence and the kind of evidence that would use statistics um, to support the claims that they're making as part of the arguments uh, during a, a debate round. Uh, even at, even before that, when they're preparing the case to go uh, and debate those rounds, uh, they're trying to understand what the claims are that they're going to make, or really what arguments they're going to have to make to win their case if they're going affirmative or uh, to cast doubt on their opponents if they're negative in, in a debate round. Um, and so statistics obviously plays a role as they're looking at the evidence that they're preparing to present in support of the claim, to, to support, uh, provide warrants for their claims. And so one of the things that we um, stress a lot um, in, in NCFCA is to handle evidence uh, with integrity. Uh, we want any time you use evidence of any kind, um, quoted data, empirical studies, what, whatever the case may be, we want 
our students to learn to handle those with the utmost integrity. Um, and that you can see how that ties into some of the things that you've already talked about, um, you know, with, with how uh, it can be not dealt that way, um, either on purpose or by in or in error. Um, so, so some of those things that uh, that you, we need to watch out for. So, so I'll start off with that sort of uh, background. When our debaters are looking at um, uh, and they read a lot of uh, peer-reviewed journal articles, uh, newspaper articles, uh, all kinds of different sources as they're preparing for it. Uh, what would you suggest are some best practices to focus on the most important parts to focus on in a, in a study uh, in, in any one of those kind of sources? So, yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I, I guess I start off by warning. I don't know about other disciplines, but I give a warning in in going to journals in economics because economists use terms that you, that you students use in regular language and often, not always, but often will give different definitions to them. So be careful because some sometimes what you're reading may mean something very different than what a regular non-economist would think reading it. So that's, that's one thing. But if you're going to go through the journals, um, what I tell my students is um, start you start at the abstract, which will give you, you know, one paragraph thing at the beginning, which will give you an idea as to whether this article is relevant to the question you're asking. If it is relevant to the question you're asking, I would go straight to the conclusion and read that because often the conclusion is written in a much more uh, user friendly manner uh, than, than, than what you see on, on the interior of the thing. So that, that's, that's one thing I would argue. Um, you might find you'll find more user-friendly sources outside of academic journals. And there you have to be really careful because it runs the gamut from high quality stuff like you might find in the Wall Street Journal to low quality stuff like you'll find on Vox, right? Don't be quoting Vox. Quoting Wall Street Journals is, is okay. And that's an easier it's an easier read than the academic journals. And what's happened there is somebody, some smart person has gone and read the journal and, and regurgitated it for you in non-economist language. Yeah, very, very good, very good advice um, for sure. I, I think it definitely carries into lots of different fields, um, uh, the, the similar kind of ideas. Uh, so would you, be able to give our debaters maybe a, a, a like a quick or maybe some key questions to ask off a study. So now we're zooming in to a study that may be included in, in an article. Um, what may be some key questions that they could zoom in on and ask um, to understand and identify perhaps also because when you're going negative, you have to try and identify holes in, in the other person's arguments and cases. Um, so e either or both of those things. Yeah, um, some, some things right off that you all probably know already. When you, hear, when you hear dollar figures quoted, are they adjusted for inflation? That matters. Are they per capita? that matters as well. So for example, uh, one of my MBA students actually just today said, uh, well, this is strange that the United States is, uh, is a free economy relative to China, but China's GDP is actually larger than the United States. And I said, hang on, it's not the GDP that matters, it's the GDP per capita. Yes, China's GDP is larger, but on a per person basis, a per capita basis, the US economy is six times the size of, of China. So adjustments like that matter, inflation per capita, there are other things you might think of. Um, one of the important things, and I, I notice this a lot in debates that I've observed, people will quote um, polling numbers and a good source for, for polling numbers that I, I use myself and I recommend is Pew, 
Pew Research, PEW. And one of the important things that, uh, that, that people, one of the important things that people trip up on is they will report the results of polls or surveys, and they will paraphrase the question that was asked. And in paraphrasing the question that was asked, you can lose very important information. Um, so one of the things that I would do if I were debating somebody and they presented some evidence of something that came from a poll or a survey is I would ask what verbatim, what was the question that was being asked of the respondents? Yeah, um, so, so along the same, that's, that's a great recommendation. Um, along those same lines, would are there other sources or um, um, places that, that they should maybe go to when they're looking for, especially things related to statistics or uh, empirical evidence kind of things that, that you would recommend? Yes. Um, so for kind of a place you can go for one-stop shopping is FRED which stands for Federal Reserve Economic Database. It's a database uh, maintained by the Federal Reserve, and you can get to it easily. Just go to Google and say FRED GDP or FRED Median Household Income. It'll take you right there, and it has the data, it has the sources, it has, it'll has. it give you a graph. You can see the whole thing. It's very user-friendly. So I, I usually go there for my um, economic data. There is, uh, for, for data on crime, I highly recommend Bureau of, Just Bureau of Justice Statistics, BJS, Bureau of Justice Statistics. Um, for anything involving COVID, of course, the CDC. Uh, and, and again, and then um, I mentioned Pew. Pew is also a good place to get a whole hodgepodge of different uh, sorts of survey data. Absolutely. Um, so so the, um, our debate topic, the team policy debate topic for this year, that our students are gonna be uh, studying and debating on uh, has to do with US federal government policy towards um, convicted prisoners under federal jurisdiction. So that, that's sort of the overall topic that they'd be debating. And so your, um, your uh, source there with uh, related to uh, Fred uh, is very appropriate. Thank you very much. Are there any other sources that come to mind? Uh, and also, if I could, a, a follow up there. Uh, if if you're if you're familiar with that area, it, what may be some of the uh, the statistics or constructs that they should maybe be paying more attention to? In that, and area? this is yeah. And can you repeat once more the topic? The federal government policy towards uh, federal. Uh, Convicted prisoners under federal jurisdiction. Okay, yeah. Um, I would, uh, one place that I would go, and you probably don't want to quote them, not to say that they aren't quotable, they are, um, but your opponent will have problems with it, is Institute for Justice. They do a lot of work, they're a think tank, they do a lot of work involving criminals and criminal rights in the justice system. And while I wouldn't, in a debate scenario, I probably wouldn't use them for as a source, again, not because they're not reliable, it just gives my opponent something to attack. Rather, I would use IJ as, as a source of sources. So go to IJ, they've already done the heavy lifting, and they're going to list sources for the things they tell you that are Bureau of Justice statistics and things like I've, I've uh, mentioned. So, so that's one place that I would go. Another place you might try is, uh, is Cato. One, one thing that I find very useful uh, as, a, as a debate strategy is when I know I'm going to be, when I know I'm going to be debating on one on one side of a topic, I will use sources that are friendly to the opposite side. And, and doing that gains me a much more credibility. Uh, because, because when the person says, well, look, I question your sources, I can say, look, these sources actually are people who are biased in favor of your position. And yet, despite that, the data is showing you what I'm telling you. 
Oh, Dr. David, thank you so much for saying that. that I, I am so on board with you, and that is something that we are passionate about helping our students understand, uh, to, to debate with the utmost integrity, which, which includes using things that are, that are potentially fair to, to both sides. Uh, and and it, I absolutely agree with you, it builds uh, credibility and um, makes for some really great debates uh, that are not just completely one-sided uh, because you've set it up that way. Um, so, so appreciate that a lot. Um, so a couple of other things, and I know you've probably heard this uh, a million times, correlation is not causation. Um, right, they co constantly, whenever you talk about any study, that, that's one of the things. I think we fall in error of, of that a lot of times uh, without maybe thinking about it, um, or others use it. And so if you can just talk about that phenomenon and, and maybe some, some guidance on how to, uh, sure. how to address that. Yeah. So. Um correlation is is not causation and i i when i le give this lecture to my students i say uh, how many of you set your alarm this morning and of course all their hands go up i say uh, did the sun rise yeah sure and the next day you know tomorrow you're going to set your alarm yeah is the sun going to rise yes i say look at this correlation here right and of course it's not setting the alarm causes the sun to rise in fact the, the causation goes the other direction so just because you're seeing correlation doesn't necessarily mean there's causation. Um, I, I pub, I've done a number of studies on the relationship between economic freedom and, and socioeconomic outcomes. So things like, you know, people's incomes, poverty rates, unemployment, child labor, all sorts of things you would think about that, that are indicative of a healthy society. And I showed that these two things move together that the more economic freedom you have, the more, the better these socioeconomic outcomes are. To which people will respond to me, yeah, but correlation isn't causation. You've just shown correlation. And my answer is, yes, that is correct. Correlation is not causation. But the absence of correlation is the absence of causation. The absence of correlation is the absence of causation. So as I look at this data, what do I not see? I do not see a correlation between economic freedom and bad socioeconomic outcomes. Therefore, I can conclude that economic freedom does not cause bad socioeconomic outcomes. In fact, it might cause good economic socioeconomics. That's what I think, but that's all I can say there is, is correlational. What I can say it is, is that it is not causational in the opposite direction. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. So so that's kind of also related to your dog example, right? Right. Uh, the, yeah. the absence of evidence, um, the absence of correlation, right? Yeah, yeah. The uh, the 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 absence the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Um, in the mm -hmm. case of correlation. Um, you are getting evidence. The question is, is the evidence causational? And the answer is, you know, well, no, it's correlational and may or may not be causational. But if you've got causation, if you have causation, you will have correlation. Yes. So if okay. I'm not seeing correlation, I'm not seeing causation either. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That that's that's really good clarification. Um, so a couple of questions. One is you said um, in your talk, you talked about learning how to ask the right questions um, uh, of the data, of a study, whatever, uh, you know. Um, so can you share a little bit of your uh, suggestions on how we learn to do that? Yeah, interestingly, um, it has little to do with statistics. It has a tremendous amount to do with reading comprehension and communication. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I teach statistics at a whole bunch of levels at, 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 in college. And, um, and one of the things I, I say to my intro level students is easily a third of this course is not gonna involve statistics at all. 
it's going to involve reading something in English and understanding what it meant. And, and then on the back end, when you get answers in statistics, converting them into English such that the English you convert it into correctly represents what you're seeing in the in the statistics. And, and the, the hard part there is actually, again, it's not the statistics, it's the reading comprehension and communication. So when I showed you those two sentences about um, the difference between an officer being a promoted female and a promoted officer being a female, that's a subtle difference that that is very important to to the statistics and many people not all people by any means but many people find it difficult to to understand that subtlety and that's entirely reading reading comprehension and communication yeah yeah very good thank you so uh would you share your recommendations on if our students want to get started on on statistics and learning how to, you know, not understand some of the foundations. You've given a fantastic um, foundational webinar here uh, that I hope every single one of our debaters gets to, to watch and, and learn from. Um, but go in the next steps. How, you know, how do we uh, learn that and apply it when we're looking at studies and, and what are the important things to, to learn and do that? effectively probably yeah i would say the next step is get your hands dirty um getting out there and messing around with data seeing what's there is very useful you know, to this day i still in fact yesterday i was looking up something on fred some esoteric economic measure and i saw and i'm doing a search on there i saw that they had a couple of variations on this thing which I wasn't aware of. And apparently there's, you know, there was a difference. There was a subtle difference in these measures that I didn't know and I wouldn't have known except that I got my hands dirty. I'm digging in there in the data. So that's one of the interesting things. I'll give you an example. Um, we talk about income, right? And there's a difference between income. Well, I should be more, more specific. Money income, family income, household income, wages and salaries, compensation, those things all sound like the same thing, but they're, they're different. And if you go into Fred, you'll see each one of these things listed out. And in just by seeing that these are different things, it's going to prompt you to say, okay, I've got to figure out what the distinction is amongst these things. And now you have this in your tool belt. So when you go to debate and somebody says income, you say, hang on, do you mean household income or family income? Because those two are very different and you'll get different results depending on which one you use. And I guarantee you the person you're debating, you know, they've just blown a gasket at that point. They're not gonna be able to deal with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, good stuff. Um, one last question, um, Dr. Davis, if, if you would, um, if you could give us some, um, recommendations of good resources uh, for our students to get to, again, sort of to get get started, get going, um, to, things to, to look at and study. Uh, and then after that, if there's anything else, um, unfortunately, we're coming to the end of, of the session, um, but anything else that you might want to add to to help uh, our students in the in the Sure. Area. Yeah. Um, and I would, I would recommend going to YouTube and finding, you can find videos on particular topics in statistics. And I would, I recommend my, my channel. You can find me YouTube slash Anthony Davies. And I have maybe a hundred videos on uh, statistics and they're all little snippets that involve a particular thing in statistics and so you want to know you know measures of central tendency i've got a video on this you can go and look at it and you can see what this is and get to understand a little bit better and then you know if you're interested you go on to the next one and so by doing this you'll develop you won't develop the ability to conduct statistical analysis necessarily but you will develop the ability to understand it so when your opponent talks about, you know, um, he looked at the variance of this thing and found the following things, you know what he's talking about. You know what this means. 
Yeah, absolutely. That is great advice. Thank you so much again. I, I, I think this has been phenomenal. We appreciate your time. Um, I love that you not only laid the foundations of statistics, but uh, I, I really agree with you on some of the other things that you covered that I think are so, well, I don't think, I, I know that are so important for our debaters, um, you know, uh, integrity, um, dealing with data in with integrity and reading things and understanding things, giving uh, your, um, creating a fair ground for the debate for, for your opponents as well. Um, and the importance of critical thinking and communication and not just the, the technical details of working with data or statistics. Um, those are all really excellent um, uh, thoughts and, and just basically reinforcing what we're trying to help uh, our students learn, even as they engage in this great activity uh, that is team policy debate. Uh, so thank you so very thank much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, I'd like to thank you both again. That was fascinating. I, I think a very helpful session for our debaters to start thinking about the way that statistics um, will be used in their policy debates and perhaps as well in their value debates. Um, we're looking forward um, to just the application of that. So thank you again, Dr. Davies and Dr. Paul for your, for your time. And students, I wanna encourage you, we've got two more fee webinars that are coming up on the 15th and the 16th. Um, November 15th is the TP resolution with um, Devin Kurtz from the Cicero Institute. And the 16th will be uh, Dr. Art Cardin um, will discuss the LD resolution. So I know you'll want to catch those as well. And if you're looking for a practical application um, to go ahead and get started practicing, um, I think you've probably heard that NCFCA is for the first time ever going to run a couple of practice sessions um, where it'll be just like a practice tournament, um, not a full tournament, but a few rounds of both speech and debate. It'll give both students and parents an opportunity to shake off the, the rust or to see the platform for the first time. Um, you can get some feedback on your speech. I know last year when we did some practice things, we didn't necessarily get ballots back, but you will get ballots for our winter warmups. Um, so this will give you a great opportunity to get started. Um, those dates, there are four different dates in December. Look on your NCFCA dashboard and you can see those. You can see how to register. Um, you will want to check those out quickly. The first couple of dates close registration early next week. So we'd love to have you um, participate in that, give you an opportunity to see your friends from around the country, um, maybe to get that feedback on your speech or to try out your new case ideas. Um, with really good statistical use. So we will look forward to seeing you there, to seeing you on a webinar. And again, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you.